Welcome back, everybody. So picture the African savanna for a minute. What predator can you think of that's been known to back down entire prides of lions, confuse packs of mongoose that eat deadly snakes for a living, and turn master hunters like cheetahs around in their tracks and send them home with their tail between their legs? Well, that's what we're going to talk about when we come back on Intrepid Exotics. There you go. Come on. There you go now. So this right here is Niles. And he is my Nile monitor. So you're not going to find a much more challenging reptile than this guy right here. They're similar to Asian water monitors. But Asian water monitors tend to be much easier to tame down and socialize. Um, Niles right here, he can be a little bit unpredictable sometimes. It takes a lot of time. But he still does pretty good under the circumstances. You know, when I first got him, he was a fraction of the size of his tail. Um, you going, bud? He has gotten to the point where he doesn't have a whole lot of fear of anything. Um, he's really, really food driven. And it takes a lot of patience and a good deal of caution to handle these guys. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't come across as really mean, but as you can see, he has got a massive tail on him. And these claws are nothing to be trifled with. They will, they will really hurt you. Even when he is not trying to be mean at all, when he's trying to be nice and just explore. If he gets it in his head that he doesn't want to be held at that second, then, um, you know, when he pushes off with those claws, they will lay you wide open. So this is an example of one time that he had jumped out of his enclosure on me. And when I went and picked him up, he made it perfectly clear that he didn't want to go back in, kicked and screamed a little bit, and this is the end result of that little episode. So as you can see, they've got some really gnarly claws on them. Uh, so you got to be really careful when you're handling these guys. Uh, it's really in your best interest to try to keep them as calm as possible. Now when I got this guy, he was a baby, just a fraction of the size of his tail is right now. And I believe he was wild caught. So these monitors, they're really intelligent, they're really smart animals, but again, they're really instinct driven, they're really food driven, and you've got to be really careful with them when they're babies, because you can kind of misconstrue um, what their body language is at times. You'll, you'll see sometimes when people will be holding them, you know, that their uh, monitor is going to be really still, not really moving. Um, and they think that just because they're not moving, not trying to get away, that they're content. But a lot of times they're just really frightened. And you'll be able to see it because when they get distressed, their throat will punch out on them. It'll, you know, they'll blow up their, their throat, haunch up, uh, try and make themselves look bigger. And when they do that, they're stressed out. They're not really happy about being held. And it's one thing to look out for when they're young is you don't want to continually stress them out. But that being said, the only way to really socialize them is to handle them. So, you know, the only way to handle them is to, you know, pick them up and get them used to it. And I'd really like to have him in the video for the whole time. But there's something about working with monitor lizards, particularly Nile monitors, because they can be so temperamental. Um, I am not going to do a whole lot of moving him when he doesn't want to be moved. I'm not going to do a whole lot of going after him. Uh, this is one of those things like we talked about in previous videos where you've got to build trust with the animals. And if you're constantly chasing after him every time you interact with him, they're not really going to trust you. So I'm waiting on him to do just what he's doing right now. Come peek up and see what's going on and, you know, come out of his own volition. 
And you really got to be careful too when you're trying to get these guys' attention because, you know, I'm going to drum on here to, to, you know, try and draw his attention, get him over here. But. <laughs> but at the same time, you don't want to trigger a food response and, um, you know, have him come up and go after your fingers. So Nile monitors have a really interesting life cycle too. They're from Africa, and they're typically you'll you'll see the uh, you'll see their eggs laid in um, um, ant hills, termite mounds, things like that, way underground. Uh, the parents will go down, lay their eggs there, and pretty much abandon them, uh, leave them to their own resources. So when they hatch, they've got to burrow their way out, find their way out of there, and. Um, yeah, do that all on their own. When they get out, they're a hundred percent on their own. And when they're younger, they're going to be eating things, you know, insects, really small rodents, things like that. Um, and of course, as they get older, he'll eat anything that you put in front of him. Uh, right now, he's on a diet mainly of fish and shrimp and rodents. Uh, I'll cut up chunks of fish for him and. Um, you know some shell on shrimp and then throw some mice in there periodically just to kind of mix up his diet a little bit you know you can feed him things like eggs and ground turkey and different kinds of meats and so forth but uh, you know, he, he seems to be doing really well on what he's been eating so far and as you can see the enclosures on these guys can be kind of involved uh, this one right here I actually framed an old bathtub into it for his water source it makes it real easy to drain I've got a valve on the bottom all I got to do is turn the valve let it drain into the uh, open drain on the floor here hose it out fill it back up I keep a heater on it so that the water stays fairly warm for him and of course he's got his basking spot it's got um, the uh, basking bulb over a uh, over a slab so the slight slab stays warm gives him a lot of heat um, and You'll hear, you'll hear a lot of people say too that you don't use screen enclosures for them because of the uh, problems with humidity and so forth. I've got a couple things working in my favor. One, um, I do have an enclosed section of this enclosure here where it's uh, made out of melamine and I've got plexiglass doors on it. And this part right here is just an add-on. So he's got his full water tub right there and probably 70% of the time that he's in here He's actually in his tub. The rest of the time, he's up here on his platform. Hey, bud. Are you gonna make an appearance? Hmm? You make? Okay. <laughs> and he loves his water. He will swim around in there all day long. And he actually sleeps in there a lot of the time too. So, and these guys can socialize, tame down really nicely. You know, there's examples out there of Nile monitors that are just really puppy dog tame. Niles isn't quite to the puppy dog point yet. Uh, he does he does enjoy interaction, but he really does it on his own terms. Ain't that right, bud? And I haven't had quite as much time as I'd like to to really, really work on socializing him. In the summertime, I do have a harness for him, so I'll take him outside and let him roam around. Um, you've got to be really careful with the harnesses, though, because, um, you know, these are really powerful animals, and they can't hurt themselves. On it. So, the way I always explain um, working with him when he's on harness is treating him like he's not on one at all. The only purpose for that thing, and the only purpose for the leash, is to make sure that he doesn't take off and get away. So, good. But as you can see, he's pretty tolerant of being messed with. I mean, he's not afraid of me, but he has at times um, taken some shots at me. Every now and then, if you approach him just wrong, you'll get that tail whip, the same one that was chasing the lions away, and you get popped with that thing. You know, from a, and he's pushing five feet now. And you get popped with that tail from a five foot lizard, and you know you've been hit. Uh, he can really whip that thing around. And I have been bit by him a couple times. 
Uh, one time was completely my fault. Um, I was reaching in there. I just finished getting his food ready. He was up in his basking spot. I got in a hurry, reached around to grab his food bowl. And when I did, he got whiff of that fish that was on my fingers. And right before I got the, right before I got the food bowl out, he got a hold of me. And, uh, you know, he instantly let go, realized that it wasn't food. Uh, so we're grateful about that because they do have some very sharp teeth and some really powerful jaws. He has the only time that he's ever done this. Um, and I've, I've held him a lot, uh, particularly when we go outside. Because when he starts running off someplace where he's not supposed to go, you know, I'll pick him up because I'm not, you don't drag him by the leash. Um, you know, when he starts going off someplace and I need to get him collected back, I'll pick him up, set him on my shoulder. And typically, of course, he's really stubborn and he wants to get down on the ground and run. So he crawls over my back, kind of jumps down the backside. But it's just kind of a dance that you have to do with these guys. Um, but I came in here one day and, you know, I, I think... I think what kind of brought this on too is I was getting a little bit too comfortable with him and I was bringing him out to interact. He was, you know, on his ramp just getting out of his tub and I just reached in, picked him up and set him on my shoulder. I don't think he was too keen on that at the moment because he got up and sometimes you know, crawl up on your head and so forth. And he did that just like normal, except all of a sudden I felt his jaws clamp down on the back of my spine. He got right across the back of my neck and hung on. Uh, it took me a good few minutes to get him to get him off of me, and I was really worried uh, that maybe there was going to be pieces of my neck missing. So he had a good grip on me. And then when I and then when I managed to get him off of my neck and get him put back in the enclosure, you know, I had the door open just like I do now. And he just decided to hang on to my arm for dear life. All four of his legs were wrapped around my arm. Got really big scratches along the back of my arm, you can see here. So, you know, I kind of got the double whammy that day. Took the teeth and the claws, so. So like I say, you, you absolutely have to stay on point with these guys. Now this guy right here is by far one of my favorite animals. Hands down, he's just, he's amazing to work with, he's amazing to deal with. One of the, this, is, this is one of those things where if you're watching this to make the decision on whether you should get one or not, probably shouldn't. Um, they are a handful. You know, there's, there's smaller monitors, um, ackies and things like that, that are a lot more conducive to being handled. Uh, they're a lot less um, intensive as far as the time that you've got to spend with them. There is a lot to learn, and you know, I use him as the example of building trust with your animals, and and to demonstrate how that we've got to trust them and make ourselves vulnerable in order to build that relationship. Uh, this guy right here is no joke. You know, like I said, he's pushing five feet long. He's got razor sharp claws. He's got really powerful jaws. And it raises the stakes on how dedicated you are to handling these guys. Because, as I've said before, it, it's really ill advised, um, particularly when they're younger. Um, as they get older, as they get socialized, they can get a little more accustomed to it. You know, I'm able right now to go in and scratch him on the back and come in, pet him on the top of the head. But with younger ones, you know, that's what everything does before they eat, before they get eaten. Um, you know, everything's going to swoop down on them from the top, so it scares them quite a bit, and it really can spoil the relationship that you've got with them. So the whole time when he was younger. You know, I'd always approach him right up from his face, you know, start rubbing under his chin and so forth and get him, get him accustomed to me. And it's worked pretty well. He does pretty good. Ain't that right now? So one thing I can say without a moment's hesitation about these guys too, Nile monitors are by no means in any way to be construed as a beginner reptile. Um, 
a lot of these guys that you'll find are going to be wild caught which already puts us at a disadvantage with socializing them because the more the more generations you have bred into captivity the more likely they're going to be uh, accustomed to human contact uh, they, they actually as the generations progress in captivity they get easier and easier to tame down uh, you know so the wild caught ones really difficult to work with sometimes um, I've been fortunate with this guy uh, I have spent a lot of time uh, working with him getting him comfortable getting him used to being handled and so forth so you know anytime that I need to move him out of his enclosure or something or if I want to take him outside take him for a walk he does pretty good but you know he's really really stubborn um, I'm guessing that if there's any other Nile monitor keepers out there you're going to uh, going to be able to back that up because I know mine when he wants to do something he wants to do it he, he doesn't want any input from anybody else um, so the enclosures on these guys too are going to be really involved um, they've got to have pretty much everything uh, they've got to have enough room to move around enough room to climb um, if you get them too small of an enclosure they'll start having digestive problems get impacted and so forth and so they've got to be able to exercise they've got to be able to swim because they love the water uh, I, I, I think he's in his tub more than he's out of it and the only time he's really you know up there basking is uh, you know right after he's eaten he'll get up there and bask for a little while and you know you see him up there periodically but he loves his water he's always playing in that um, you know they've got to have a decent amount of humidity so with this with the enclosure that i've got for him it's, it's a two-part enclosure i've got this part right here that's screened in just because i need the extra space and i'm not going to enclose this whole thing in windows i keep it warm down here in my reptile room and it's directly over his main water source and i've also got an enclosed area that's made out of melamine with plexiglass doors on it and on the bottom i keep a uh, a good eight ten inches of soil in there with a hide keep it moist so he's got that humidity and he can dig and and you know he's got that solitude of his hide plus on the top of that is where i've got his basking light it sits right under a window so he gets natural sunlight plus he gets the heat bulb and it's all sitting over a piece of slate so he's got a nice warm you know at least 120 degree uh, spot where he can sit up there and warm up and digest his meals um, and even so yeah, you know, with all this space that he's got now, he's starting to outgrow this as well. So, the next enclosure that's coming for him is going to be about twice his size. And <clears throat> I'm going from a standard tub to I am going to get a big garden tub and then frame out the enclosure around that. Get him a larger spot with more basking area, more places to dig. So he's got he's got a whole new house coming here uh, as soon as I can facilitate it. That's the thing about keeping, you know, big reptiles that are a lot of fun to play with. You've also got to have a lot of room for them. You know, I've got him and I've got um, three snakes in here that are over 12 feet long that need pretty sizable enclosures. You know, plus all the little leopard geckos and bearded dragons, ball pythons, king, king snakes, hog nose, all that stuff. So, you know, these guys will definitely take up some space. Um, your Nile monitor is probably going to have the biggest enclosure in the house. And you can see how easily excitable he is right there. You know, just going down and petting him, he gets he gets locked onto that hand, and he's just right over there and right after it. This guy has zero fear at all. Hey, that right, bud. And one thing that I found with mine is that you know when he was young, he was real really easy to work with didn't take me very long at all to get him coming up and eating off the tongs and then coming out walking out of my arms and so forth now as he gets older and starts to mature he's starting to get more confident and as you can see confidence is not something that these guys naturally lack there's not too many things that are really going to make him run you know just like you can see in those videos where you know he's got five six seven lions that are squaring off on him and they're just sitting there standing their ground like come on let's do this and he's 
he's the same way and you'll have your times where they shy away and it, you know may catch them unexpected they flinch maybe go to the other side of the enclosure but you know, bottom line is that when these guys get some size to them and they get confident you've really got to negotiate with them because they will they will stand their ground and they will make you work for everything that you try and do to them that they don't want you to do to them uh, so it's really important to keep working with these guys continually um, from the time they're a hatchling all the way up to the time they grow up so I want to take a moment too to mention a gentleman by the name of Rob Faust uh, he actually wrote the book on Nile monitors uh, he's a really really helpful guy uh, he helped me through a couple tough spots when this guy started getting a little bit older and started having some problems with enclosure change and things like that and left me kind of scratching my head um, Rob was kind enough to take the time to talk with me and share some of his experience with me and kind of help make sure that we was keeping this guy on track and that I was doing the right thing so um, big thank you out to Rob for that if you're watching I appreciate it man and so does Niles and anybody else that's even considering getting a now monitor uh, you need to get on here I'll leave the link in the description pick up that book Rob's got a lot of knowledge about these animals and like I said he's been really helpful to me uh, through this whole process of, of learning and, and keeping this guy healthy and uh, as happy as he can be and to elaborate a little bit on um, walking these guys on a leash uh, you see a lot of people do it and you know, I started doing it because I think it's a really awesome way to get these guys um, some enrichment to get him outside get him more into his natural environment let him explore um, you know, I think it's a lot healthier for him to be able to do that but there's a couple considerations that you've got to have um, when you're walking these guys on a leash um, one is is that you want to be able to treat that animal as if he's not on a leash at all um, you don't want to be jerking him around by it you know there's going to be times when they try and run going to be times when they flail and fight a little bit and it's going to be tricky but you really can't use that harness to hold on to them by a couple reasons and one these guys are really really powerful and you know they can't hurt themselves on that if you let them thrash around and you're just holding them by that leash Sooner or later, your animal's gonna hurt themselves. Either that, or they're gonna slip out of that harness and they're gonna take off on you. So, you've really, really gotta be careful when you're walking them. Like I said, I treat mine as if they're not on anything. Um, I've got Niles here into the habit of, you know, having me walk over him and beside him and so forth. Uh, so he doesn't get freaked out by that at all. There is times when right after I take him outside he starts flailing around and wants to run and so forth and you've really got to only use that leash and the harness just enough to keep them from getting away and then as much as you may not like it you gotta have your hands on them um, if, that, if he starts getting freaked out and, and spooked and so forth then you know you've got to be able to get your hands on him get him calmed down and get him back over in another another location where he can go ahead and start enjoying his enjoying his trip outside because uh, you certainly don't want to get him all tied up in that harness and so forth um, and that's where that's where uh, just some experience handling these guys and the willingness to deal with some scratches and some blood comes in uh, just about every time I've got him outside he draws blood on me he doesn't mean to he's not being mean he's not being really skittish or anything but you know if he wants to go someplace and I've got to pull him back get him back into my own yard or something and he doesn't want to go all it takes is one swipe of that leg while he's trying to climb up you and you're gonna be wiping yourself off because um, like I said they're, they're razor sharp claws and then they'll, they'll do a number on you quick um, so just be careful when you when you've got them out on a leash and a harness and so forth you know you really don't want to depend on that thing any more than is absolutely necessary. Look at somebody sneaking up on me. Heard me say harness. What you think, man? I know it's too cold outside now. I'm kind of shit out of luck. There you go, bud. Look at the tail on this guy. You know, I'm sure you can probably see it. This thing, I can't even fit my hand all the way around it. And this thing 
is like a whip. When he decides it's time to hit you with it, <clears throat> you really don't want to be anywhere near it. <laughs> and he's decided to go back up to his basking platform. I guess he's had enough of the water for a little while. So oddly enough, you know, you're not going to see me in this video having him crawling all over me and, and so forth. Handling him just as just as little as humanly possible. Like I said, the last time I had him out, he ended up getting a bite into my neck. So, <clears throat> so I am being really cautious with him. Making sure that I don't stress him out at all. Don't want to get him excited. And I really don't want to give everybody the impression that these guys are um, cuddly little puppy dogs. Because that, I believe, is the exception rather than the rule. Yeah, you're gonna find, like I said, some, some captive bred animals that some people have put a lot of time into to get them nice and socialized and so forth. But but it takes a lot of work and it takes a lot of time. So if you're prepared for all of that, awesome. This animal would use every bit of time that you decided to vote to it. If you don't have that kind of time, maybe you want to go with something a little bit easier than a Nile. I do have the anticipation that, you know, as I've got him a little bit longer and as he matures, um, I do expect him to calm down a little bit. Yeah, he's, he's not terribly jumpy or anything right now. And, you know, I think that's just going to come with age, you know, more familiarity with me, more time working with me and so forth. And I expect him to calm down a good deal. Um, yeah, I'd like to get him to the point where I could take him out in public and take him to reptile shows and things like that. But I'm not going to take anything out to a reptile show unless I'm 100% sure that it's not going to stress the animal out and it's not going to hurt anybody. So, this guy, he's still not quite there yet. So, it's just going to be me and him working together for a little while. What you doing, man? Now this is a perfect example of what I was what talking about doing? when I said that these guys can be unpredictable. Um, we've been sitting here with him all morning, just talking, interacting with him and so forth. He crawls up on his basking platform and I reach up and touch his tail to get his attention. He thinks there's a food opportunity there and he comes sailing at me with his mouth open. And you'll notice the way I react to him is I get out of his way, I give him a little bit of space, and then I give his mind to start working and realize, okay, we're not getting fed. I don't want to end this experience right here on a bad note, run away from the enclosure, because he got excited. Um, I want to just sit here, continue to interact with him, let his mind slow down a little bit, let him relax, and he's just fine. And like I said, when you're working with these guys, You've just really got to work right up in front of their face here where they can see everything. And you don't want to stress them out at all. This guy does pretty good most of the time. But he is really big on letting you know that it's his world and you're just visiting. But it's always a work in progress with these guys. It's just building those little threads, having those little positive experiences with them all the time. And you know, sooner or later, they all start to add up and the animal starts to realize that you're not a threat, you're not gonna hurt it. you start to get along just fine. So Niles here wants you guys to like this video because he knows you like seeing him. Get subscribed to the channel and get notified of when we put new stuff out because I do have some other stuff that's going to be coming out with him and the other guys soon. Uh, and of course, as always, if you've got any questions, I know we didn't cover everything, but if there's anything else that you'd like to know or anything else that you'd like to see, drop it in the comments. I'll be sure to address it. And... Uh, Come on, bud. What are you doing?
Really appreciate you guys hanging out with me today and I will see you next time at Intrepid Exotics.